I'd like us to remain focused on this, to continue to shift our thinking from a patient focus to a patient in environment focus. And just to show you how profoundly mental illness shapes every member of a family when it is present, when it is present in a family, let me introduce you to Ethan and his family. He smashed his hand through something, and you know, it was bleeding everywhere, and it was just, it was scary. You know, he like ran out of the house. It was just like walking around our road with like a bloody hand, and it was just, it was scary. It was really scary. I had a girl over, and we were doing drugs all night, and she ended up passing out in my room, and I woke up the next morning, and then uh, we left the house for a little bit, and I came home. My dad was home, and I didn't clean up the mess. So there was just drug paraphernalia like everywhere, and it, me and my dad got into a huge fight. I punched him in the air and left. I think he th threw a lamp in my direction. I don't know if he threw it at me, you know, and, and it shattered. Uh, I called 911. Allie's crying. I said I needed him removed from the house. There were a couple of years that were um, uh, my worst nightmares. I was at work one day and my husband called me and he said, you have to come home, we have a problem. My daughter had been in the house and EJ was downstairs and um, was doing some things uh, that scared her. Uh, and when my husband came home and confronted um, him, he just went into a rage. When we asked EJ to leave, um, it was really because we had other kids. And we had to get our home back. Um, and if he couldn't be part of it, then he, he couldn't be part of it. So we have lots of data that points to the critical and destructive power of the environment in the form of what we've heard a lot about, right? Repeated invalidation. And families are prime suspects, and it makes perfect sense because they're at the front line. They're there 24-7. And obviously, as we've heard, today in several instances. This is true for some family environments because they, um, they, they are pretty maladaptive. But in many cases, it's not. Dr. Perry Hoffman, who opened up the conference this morning, said to me one time, well, the very nature of parenting involves some invalidation, right? I have mountains of anecdotal data pointing to the positive redemptive power of families. And of course, it's not all families, but it's pretty much all the families I've come across. And this is true in different ways, but of both the more highly functioning families that I refer to, that I meet through family connections or privately, but it's also true of the ones who come to me from Department of Children and Families. Dr. Frizzetti actually said to me one time that the only proven predictor of a good outcome is having somebody who is validating in the environment. So it seems to me that understanding tangibly the effect of families in treatment would be really important. And that's what I'd like to ask your help with. More clinicians right now do include families, but the vast majority, despite data that this is a good thing, don't include families in the bulk of the treatment. Even with adolescents, despite the proven outcomes of Alec Miller's model. And there's some really valid reasons for that. Of course, there's HIPAA, and there's client resistance. By the time clients come into treatment, they're pretty allergic to their families, and they want nothing to do with having a family member in the room. That's pretty frequent, right? And then the formal DBT protocol treatment, it, treatment protocol itself does not really include, is not really completely inclusive of families. But I'll tell you, among those of us who actively include families in treatment, the consistency that we see is in positive outcomes. There is no consistency in how we do it, though, because there is no solid research behind that. And then family work is often not covered by insurance. So solid research evidence would help us shift that, would be very helpful. 
So in the hope that you're going to be able to maybe help us think this through further, I would like to talk to you a little bit about what stands in the way from my perspective, from my experience, what stands in the way of helpful, supportive family interactions and how we can marshal families towards support in the best way that we can. And then what family skills seem to be more, most central to help patients move forward. And I'd like to start with uh, Joni's story. When I first started in this field, I completed my practicum in a program that for very valid reasons discouraged clinical interaction with families. However, it did offer a wonderful family and friends program once monthly for free. And it also offered or hosted a family connections program. So it really worked hard to do the most it could uh, for families. I had had already quite a few years working with family members, but I had just started working with clients. And I was starting to observe the complementarity of the work that was being done. And that is when I met Joni. She was in our substance use track. And she was very depressed and very suicidal. She had a successful brother who was an engineer older than her and a younger uh, sister who was also quite successful as a nurse. Her mom was quite a bit older and she was very warm, very engaging, extremely supportive. They came to family and friends meetings every single time, all three of them. And they also attended the Family Connections class. Joni, at that point, was making some real solid progress. She had started really not engaging, right? She wasn't doing her diary card. She wasn't practicing the skills. She was really sort of staying back. But by then, she had really started moving forward. And, um, and that's when her birthday, her 30th birthday, came up. And so her family had a very small little birthday party at her house, but it was very warm and beautiful and joyful. And that night, Joni went upstairs, and she went to bed, and she overdosed. And it's amazing that her mother found her. Her mother checked on her and found her, because her mother never checked on her after she went to bed. But that night, she did. And it's amazing also that she did, because Joni was already unresponsive. So you know how, how incredible that she was able to save her that way. The next day, Joni's mom called the program to tell us that Joni wouldn't be coming. And I was the one who happened to pick up the phone. It was just hard to make out what she was saying. She was so distraught, you, could, you can imagine. She was just crying and trying to tell us what had happened. And I was listening. And I was trying my best to validate what she, but how do you even, I mean, you know, it, the pain was just incredible. And then I said to her, look, I, I, I know, I hear it. And I said to her some words that in family connections, parents learn to live by. I said to her, you know, it, it, I know it's awful. It's just awful. But even in that moment, she was doing the best that she could. It was striking. I heard Joni's mom's breath intake. She calmed down almost immediately. Her voice, when she started to speak again, took on a more resolute tone. And I, I vividly remember what she said. She said, huh, yeah, she just got knocked off for a bit, didn't she? Joni graduated just a few months later in a very solid place, surrounded by her mom and her brother and her sister, who were thankful and loving. And so here's my question to you. Who graduated? Was it Joni? Or was it Joni's family? Joni and her family members? What role did Joni's family's resilience and steadfastness and support play in the fact that she was able to bounce back and that she was able to continue her progress? To engage families, I always start at the same starting point of our work together. Everybody's deep grief and sadness at the situation. The weight that everybody feels. The shame of being different. The shame that can be caused by feeling excluded and misunderstood and invalidated repeatedly over the years. 
and in most all cases, except of course those of abuse, we talk about the fact that everyone came by this honestly. That this is in so many cases, and as one patient, the son of a friend of mine called it, a terrible case of massive misunderstanding with absolutely horrible consequences that can be made better when people know what to do and know how to do it. Here are the words of a couple who attended Family Connections. And I won't read the whole thing, but they say, the experience is heartbreaking, from the rages towards each other to complete breakdowns and profound sadness. When you realize nothing you do or provide from medications or therapy, appears to help. And when families change, patients change as well. And it makes sense. Dr. Gunderson speaks about the interpersonal hypersensitivity as core and most discriminating characteristic. And he further says that interpersonal events predict remissions and relapses, dissociation, suicide, and of course, most interpersonal interaction is with families, right? So here is the rest of that slide, of that uh, quote. Guidance, they learned what to do. Guidance enabled us to temper our reactions when things were getting out of hand. And as a result, moderated our daughter's behavior. And here's the outcome on their daughter. She graduated from college, working, living independently. She's on medication and she knows that they help and she sees a psychiatrist weekly. And so of course the treatment is imperative. Those parents are also noticing that what they're doing makes a difference. This is a tiny little gra graphic that is in the Family Connections material. It's not that big on the page, it's small. And I'm fairly certain that some leaders, family connections leaders, are um, uh, not really focusing on it as much as they could. But it's a really important chart because in and by itself it depicts the transactional nature of the relationship in a home. A lot of people say it takes two to tango or it's a 50-50 relationship. And I would say it's not a 50-50 relationship. It's a 100-100 relationship, right? When it's the patient's turn to figure things out, well, they have a choice as to what to do. But then when it is the relative's time, the, the parent's time or the, yeah, the relative's time to decide what to do, then they have 100% of the choice. So negative or positive, can we agree that the family factor is not neutral? Can we look into how to harness that power for good? Can you help us investigate that untapped resource that families represent? Can that family be a turbo boost for treatment? So I'd like to talk a little bit about what stands in the way. And what stands in the way, oh, I'm already on that slide, I'm sorry, a little early, um, are strong emotions. And my question to you, the question that I would love an answer to from, from, from anybody who'd be interested in looking into this, is um, how does emotional literacy affect, in the family, affect patients, right? So people who struggle with borderline, if they are in a family that has a higher level of emotional literacy, is that good for them? There are a few common emotions that cut across all families, regardless of how solid or how wobbly they are. And interestingly, and not unlike their relatives, and that's why I have this slide up, these emotions are marked by ambivalence. So you hear how much parents desperately want to support their relative, and that would be the hope, right? And at the same time, honestly, at times, they just want to be done. It's exhausting. And that's the despair part. Sometimes they're really angry at their, at their loved one. And that's when they make them into a villain. But they feel incredible compassion. And that's the victim side. And sometimes it happens all at once within a family. And that tears the family apart. Because one family member will see their, 
person who struggles as a villain and the other one will see them as a victim. They want them to move forward and they also want to protect them from everything that the world expects of them. I work with a family currently. They're very loving and they're very involved and there's a mom and a dad, three girls, 15, 17 and 18. They are hardworking and that's a trait their older daughter has obviously inherited. They also are caring and very generous and sweet and that is entirely their second daughter who struggles with many traits of the disorder. And the youngest one is 15 and the diagnosis there is teenage. They live in a community with very good solid schools, access to some therapeutic options, no DBT. The 17 year old, let's call her Jill, smokes marijuana at least once a day and sometimes several times a day. She sometimes drinks alcohol during the day between school classes. She skips school. She takes off from home with people that her parents profoundly disapprove of. And when confronted, she locks herself in the upstairs bathroom and she bangs her head repeatedly. This is loud. It's terrifying for both her parents and for her sisters. And it's the intensity of the behavior and it's the repeated nature of the behavior. Now the father has said very clearly that nothing in his mind is worth that for him, for his wife, or for any of them really. Now there is no treatment where they live and of course as we all know that's quite prevalent, right? And we know that ultimately it's super unhelpful for everybody to tiptoe around this behavior, that we don't want to do that, that it probably reinforces it. But how understandable on their part, right? How difficult. Because it's not just fear for that child, it's fear for the whole family. So the oldest one, who is a really good student getting ready to go to college, well, she moved out pretty abruptly recently in conditions that the parents are very uncomfortable with. And so now the concern is, did they pay enough attention to her in the midst of all the crises? And then the young one, well, she's feeling very pulled between her two sisters, and she's not talking about much of it for now. The parents are exhausted. They're completely shell-shocked. They never expected any of this. And they're brave. They're looking for help. They're hanging in there. So fear. Right? That's the first huge emotion. It's fear for the family, it's fear for their relative, and it is so prevalent. You heard it in Jill's story, and you heard, you saw it on the video in Ethan's um, story. And here's Lindsay. Still really get angry with LaTanya. Uh, if LaTanya confronts her about anything, or about cleaning her room, about Lindsay, you know, getting into a daily routine things that any parent should be able to say. Lindsay gets very angry. I had made a comment to her uh, in her bedroom. It may have been about cleaning up or doing something or, you know, responsibility. And she got out of bed, you know, and she came toward me, hands like this, and I'm like, I know this is not happening. You know, I, I knew she was going to stop in her tracks. And she didn't. Can I grab a bagel? You do whatever you want to do. I would just get really angry and feel sad because someone said something to me that I didn't like, which to any other person maybe would have seemed like just something they could brush off. But I really experienced these emotions to a very, very um, high degree. Just, just, it was just intense. Are gonna be here. You know, a lot of people, they say, you know, when you're upset, you take it out on the person you're closest to. Well, I'm really closest to my mom, and because I have such intense emotions, it comes out on her, like, it's like a hurricane for her, you know, it's like a ton of bricks, you know, and um, I just remember a couple times where I've actually attacked her just totally blacked out and attacked her because I was feeling like so angry over something that I shouldn't have felt that angry about. You know, I'm not sure we can really grasp fully the shift that happens in a family 
when one of its members becomes violent to him or herself or to other members of the family. I mean, that's such a profound basic trust that gets torn, that gets destroyed. And of course, reactions to this will vary with each person within each family. Dr. Hoffman, along with Dr. Harned, has just completed a study on PTSD in family members. But overall, it would be so great to understand how fear in the family and how the expression of that fear affects patients. And it would also be because fear and trust, of course, are so closely linked, I'm really curious to understand the effect of rebuilding trust. Along with grief, another set of strong emotions in families is this sort of mix of guilt and regret, which does pop up when we address the biosocial model. The most common sentence we hear is, if only we had known. The thought that goes with that is often, I haven't been a good parent. And when families are able to recognize that at any given time, they did do the best that they could, including in that very moment while they're looking for help, then the guilt is lessened significantly. Which brings me to an important point that I think would also be very interesting. We know how profoundly disorganizing shame is as an emotion in everybody, but of course in patients, shame is enormously disorganizing. Well, the shame that I see often elicited in patients when they see the effect they have on the individual family members and on the family as a whole. To me, that would be really interesting to see. So I mentioned these in particular. There's, of course, so many emotions to, to explore, right? But I mentioned these in particular because as we engage with families, grief, fear, confusion, and the corollary of confusion, which is helplessness, and guilt and regret, are big emotions that we can so easily validate for everybody and work with. And every single family member relates to that. And this is really the secret of family connections. What we do is we take all these really negative, painful emotions, and we look to replace them with curiosity and compassion and hope and love. And it's not that hard. You know, it's sort of like a field of gold with a very thin crust of mud. And when you remove the mud, again, in most families, not all, but when you remove the mud, the gold is there. You know? So big emotions is one of the obstacles. Another obstacle uh, to enlisting families' help in supporting their, their patients is lack of understanding of the illness and how to respond, which is really lack of skills, right? Lack of knowledge. So here are those patients who are characterized by their difficulty in connecting. You know, MEA has a Sunday call-in series, and Dr. Dixon Gordon um, was speaking in that series very recently and had a talk about the interplay of emotions and interpersonal processes in BPD. A quote that was given is, the importance of this ability for all of us to connect. This ability to understand that we are worthy of connection and that patients don't have. And here is their family who is completely confused as to what is going on and how to connect effectively. How do they send a message to their relative that they are worthy of love and connection? How can they even give them a sense of who they are? Let me introduce you to Chrissy and her mom. When I was nine, I would have like these huge temper tantrums and it became really hard for me to do anything. Feeling like there's something wrong with me and that I'm innately flawed um, was part of what I think made it so hard. I mean, I, I was nine and I was contemplating suicide. She was so sad and so hollow, and I don't know that you would even be able to fathom that seeing her now. There was nothing there. There was... She 
just basically given up. <laughs> Nothing is worse for a parent than not knowing how to help their child. A common characteristic in families is complete confusion and helplessness and hopelessness. You know, families come to the world of BPD through experience, not through learning what it is. And this experience doesn't make intuitive sense at all. By the time the symptoms come, come out, it looks completely confusing, completely chaotic. The behaviors really don't make sense. It's explosions, and then it's implosions, and they're seemingly not really linked to any specific events, because as we know, the environment is so important. The usual parenting techniques don't really work, and so family members are basically watching their relatives self-destruct. They have no idea why, and they're blamed for it. And they're blamed for it by their relative, and you know else? By themselves, because deep down they know something to do with it, but they just have no idea why. Families are very often, and again, I say families, I mean most families, right? But they're often stuck between wanting change and not being able to effect that change. And it's pretty easy to enlist their involvement at that stage. We talk about the role of parents and the role of relatives and what they want for their loved one. The trust that has been lost, the feelings of inadequacy and helplessness. And as soon as we start to clarify what might be going on, the etiology and the transactional nature of the disorder, hope reappears. It's very fast. So studying how to do this in the best possible, most effective possible way would be terrific. And then lastly, another big obstacle, or yeah, an obstacle, is, is sometimes families get stuck in having a hard time redefining their goals and their relationships and their direction. So in this last video, I'll introduce you to Kathleen and Jim. Kathleen was a recognized lawyer who in fact clerked for the Supreme Court. She is an engaging, obviously very intelligent person. She's married to a successful lawyer, and they both live in DC. The illness hit her pretty late, uncharacteristically late, in her 30s, and she and her husband had to completely redefine their future. Now, most families are actually pretty adept at redefining their immediate future. You know, think of families who don't go on vacation for three or four years while kids go to college. Or So families are good at sort of putting the family's needs before their own, oftentimes. But what's harder for them is letting go of the plans that had been made. And that kind of flexibility, in my experience, seems to be what characterizes family resilience. And I'm really curious about fam family resilience and its effect on patients. So here are... Um, she... Um, tried to kill herself or, or came very close to that. And um, that's, that's the lowest, that's the lowest. That, that started a period where um, I started to learn the uh, suicide hotline number <laughs> and was a frequent caller, knew the number by heart, and uh, that, that was a low point. As long as I can remember whenever I felt hurt or pain, I felt like I wish I were dead. Now talking about embracing and redefining and that family resilience, this was Jim Payne, who today is president of NAMI and who was on the NEA BPD board for many years and who came to NAMI through borderline personality disorder that his wife had. So what is it that appears to help a lot of families to be resilient and effective in their support. And that's my last point. Psychoeducation. In my experience, psychoeducation, when families start to finally understand what is going on when we lift the chaos for them, that's such a turnaround because they can go back to doing what they do best, again, for many of them, which is love their relative. Instead of being judgmental, they become able to be compassionate and curious. Um, another 
area that I find extremely important is parenting skills. And one of the skills that is very central, just like for their relative, is mindfulness. Now, mindfulness does quite a few things. But the very first thing it does is it allows family members to let go of being right. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many people in their families have one person who's always right. Right? And they're not always right outside of the family necessarily, but in the family, they're always right. Being able to let go of being right is really important, and to know when to be right and when to be effective. Another one is the ability to observe their own limits and to be reassured and learn how to say no. That suddenly lifts this feeling that they're being held hostage. And that's huge. And that's really through mindfulness. It's that little graphic that I showed you. I'm thinking that learning how to improve emotional literacy, it's the whole primary emotions, secondary emotions, what emotions am I feeling, what emotions is my relative feeling, um, and starting to develop an emotional conversation seems to be really important and an area that I think would really be interesting to study. And then, of course, validation, learning how to validate. You know, and we already know that patients who live in more validating environments do a whole lot better. What level of validation is necessary? Some people find it really, really hard to validate. And the best they can do is not invalidate. And is that enough? Perhaps it is. Right? And all of this is aimed at rebuilding trust. And we talked about that a little bit before. So this idea of connecting trust with how well, with their family, with how well patients are doing. So in conclusion, oh, and I think I had a slide on that. So in conclusion, I need your help, we need your help in figuring this out better, more formally, more effectively for those of us who include families in the bulk of the treatment, and then as an encouragement for those of us who don't do so much of that. I talked to you about Jill. I want to recognize her mom, who is with us in the audience today. And I want to also recognize the other family members and any patients who are here with us. Yeah, really. Your love and your courage are inspiring and bottomless. And if thanks to you all, we can understand this thing better, that family-patient relationship, then we can provide them all with more effective ways to stay in the game with their loved one and their relatives will benefit. And meanwhile, I know we're all keeping our eyes on the prize and hanging in there. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening.